This is Dr. Alan Blum. On July 7, 2015, for the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society Oral History Project, talking about national public radio and tobacco. In the late 1980s, I was called by uh, the NPR anchor, Robert Siegel, on an afternoon because Congress was about to vote on a bill, and that particular night was the Academy Awards, and the bill was by a uh, Congressman Lucan in Ohio to ban the use of uh, tobacco messages and images and brand name commercials, uh, what, do they, what they call uh, product placement, in, in films in Hollywood, because uh, it had been revealed through various sources that uh, Sylvester Stallone had a contract with Brown Williamson to have Cool and other brands embedded in the films. And the, the famous example of Superman in the late 1970s, I forget whether it was Superman 1, 2, or 28, uh, had um, uh, Superman being thrown into, or the, the villain being thrown into a Marlboro van, and it had several other uh, billboards. One was for Kent. So um, the bill was on the table, and that night was the Hollywood uh, Academy Awards, and he wanted to know uh, my opinion about this. And, of course, uh, I was in favor of the bill, but in the middle of the interview, I said, you know, it's very important that you ask this question, Robert, because among the uh, main sponsors of National Public Radio uh, is uh, the leading cigarette company, uh, Philip Morris. And you could hear this extraordinary pause uh, in on on you could hear the sound of a pause and um, and the interview continued, but it it was wasn't the same after that and I went on and said that yes, one of your regular uh, underwriters is as they say uh, when the 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 break comes uh, brought to you or underwritten in part or by the Philip Morris family of companies, and by that point they had owned uh, Kraft and general Foods. And they were acquiring these uh, huge advertising subsidiaries because they were still the main advertiser on television as a, as a layer of sheep's clothing to insulate them from real investigative, uh, hard-hitting journalism. Uh, but uh, that story never ran. Uh, it was all well and good in, in, in any event for NPR to criticize uh, films and to, to, to get me supporting a bill that would ban product placement of cigarette uh, brands in, in films, but uh, when it came to NPR's own uh, corporate underwriting, um, for one reason or another, that story never aired. Now, I should say that over the years, um, I've done a, a number of, of interviews for NPR, and in, in particular, Debbie Elliott, who is the Southeastern correspondent and, uh, correspondent and for time was the anchor. Uh, on the weekend in uh, Washington, was a regular caller and uh, wanted my opinion on a lot of things. So I, I, I'm glad that they have given us uh, the opportunity to plug the, the center and doc. Uh, but I think overall they've got uh, some skeletons in their own closet. In uh, 1984, I uh, put this down in a letter to Douglas Bennett, who was president of NPR, and um, I wrote that for many months I've been intrigued by the credits at the end of broadcasts of All Things Considered that refer to monetary grants given to NPR for coverage of specific categories of news reports. Although I'm aware that NPR is unable to cover the costs of its news operation through public funds alone, I'm interested in learning how a corporation, a fund, or an individual goes about financing a specific category of news coverage. Is it possible that stories that could disclose information detrimental to the interest of such providers of funds might not be broadcast? And to what degree are you concerned about the appearance that such funding might hinder coverage of issues that could adversely affect the underwriter? Lastly, the recent inclusion of an underwritten category, such as the role of women in the election, leads me to inquire whether the trend on NPR is in the direction of underwriting very narrowly focused topics. If such is the case, then is it not the very selection of news stories increasingly uh, subject to the interest of the underwriters. And to his credit, um, a month later, uh, Douglas Bennett wrote a, a three-page letter pretty much uh, acknowledging and appreciating the questions and um, uh, claiming, of course, uh, total independence and uh, um, the, um, the, the double-blinded check and things and so forth. And it's a long letter, and he cites examples of the Great Lakes Environment series or the role of women in the election 
um, and, and basically said that there was a mutual interest in both of these parties, including NPR, covering these stories. But I think it raises the larger question, as, as public broadcasting uh, did in the, in the 1970s when the oil shortage and, and a lot of ire was vented toward uh, oil companies. Uh, PBS was known as Petroleum Broadcasting System. Um, Mo- Mobile was the underwriter of uh, Masterpiece Theater and, and other prominent shows. And, th- and that raises the whole question of, of NPR and, and, and um, public broadcasting uh, it's themselves. I mean, how did they get created? Uh, NPR and All Things Considered started airing in the early 1970s. That whole network was created really almost to to, to siphon off the, the opinion leaders or the, the folks that didn't want to put up with commercial radio and really wanted uh, news and, and intellectual discussion. And uh, the old omnibus on TV, you'd never see the likes of again. Things like that would go toward public television. So one could argue that we, we started uh, stratifying society into these intellectual networks such as NPR. And again, that presumes that those of us who listen to NPR are more intellectual, but I think that clearly the, the notion of, of not having the blatant commercials and, um, being, uh, and having an opportunity to listen more than just sound bites that pass for news, and those were the, 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 the ideal forces that created these networks and, of course, the high-quality cultural television that created PBS. But I think along the way, uh, if you listen to NPR today, uh, there and uh, a lot of the programs are underwritten by thirty second commercials i mean and and I think that creeping uh commercialism while not as blatant, has its own um sophistication because that suggests it's not really commercial and therefore these are more reliable sponsors but sponsors they are and I think that n p r really isn't as independent. You know, I, I, I would call it national liberal radio, uh, not that I wouldn't want to identify with those, that audience. I used to be addicted. I actually taped NPR uh, in the morning, morning, um, uh, the morning news and the afternoon, all things considered. But um, I think that there are, there are serious questions that, that are raised. And um, I think that when you get down to it, the Philip Morris family of companies uh, was smart to underwrite NPR at the very time they were beginning to be held uh, to greater scrutiny, and um, they got what they paid for.